Welcome to the Life's Hard Succeed Anyway podcast, where you will hear transformational stories, positive encouragement, and practical strategies to help you grow your mindset, reach your potential, live your dreams, and experience a purpose-driven, impact-filled life. Here's your host, Alan Blaine. All right, this is Alan Blaine, and I am excited to interview our special guest today, Dan Peterson. Let me tell you a little bit about Dan before we get rolling. Dan is a licensed clinical professional counselor and advanced trainer for the Nurtured Heart Approach. He is the founder and owner of The Compass for Life, a private coaching and consulting business dedicated to helping families and schools with challenging children. Dan has created a specialized 90-day parent coaching program for parents with children who have behavioral problems and are not responding to typical parenting approaches or behavioral interventions. These kids may have been diagnosed with ADHD, ODD, anxiety, depression, or other behavioral disorders. Personally, Dan has been married for 24 years to his wife, Liz, and they have three children, ages 17, 13, and 12. He loves anything outdoors and is an avid reader and loves hanging out with family. Dan, Welcome to the Life's Hard Succeed Anyway podcast. You ready for this? Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Hey, I am uh, excited to have this conversation because I know that there is a great need out there uh, and, a, and a, a large percentage of children that would fall into some of these categories that I mentioned and probably plenty of parents that are struggling and looking for solutions and looking for answers and looking for help with their children. So again, I'm, I'm super excited for this conversation today, but before we get too far into that, can you, and I'm, you know, I've given just a little brief overview of who you are and what you're all about, but can you just kind of take our readers back and give them the cliff notes version of how you got to where you are today? Sure. I think the place I like to start is I'm the oldest of six boys. Um, I, I, I grew up in, like a time where um, my dad worked full time as um, a carpenter. He had his own business. My mom stayed home and kind of interesting is they got married right out of high school because I was on the way. And by the time I was 32, they had six boys. So like every two years, my parents had a, had a new son and um, we lived in this, this really, really small house. I had one bedroom or uh, one bathroom, just a couple bedrooms and, um, the, the reason I like to kind of just start with that is I, I just, I had to grow up really quickly. I had a ton of responsibility and um, a lot of that responsibility fell on taking care of my younger brothers. And, um, you know, kind of looking back at that, that was probably parent coaching and training or therapist and training. That's where I got a lot of my just kind of intuition and kind of natural skill set to know what younger kids need and how to provide it for them. But um, Kind of fast forward when I was going through college, I, I thought I wanted to be an accountant. And um, after my first accounting class, I said, there's no chance I'm doing this. And then for the next couple of years, kind of stumbled, wasn't real sure. And then I took my first psychology course and like just immediately knew that this is what I'm passionate about. This is what I want to do. And took some child development courses and it just became real clear to me that um, I wanted to learn as much as I could about kids. Um, learn about what their needs are, how to provide it for them. And um, kind of long story, even longer, I ended up getting a master's degree in clinical psychology with a specialty in child therapy and um, worked in a lot of different settings. Uh, started my career working in a home for a family that had a child with autism. And I don't, I don't know if you know much about autism, but just typically, in, and this was probably 25 years ago, you know, people would think that people with autism, especially children, they didn't want relationships. They wanted to be independent. They didn't know how to relate. And, um, you know, a- after a few months of working with this one kid, it became really clear to me that it's not that he didn't want relationships, that he didn't know how. And people weren't patient enough to teach him how. And, like, after working with this kid probably for four years, he ended up becoming... <laughs> He saw me as his best friend. He used to ask me for like sleepovers all the time and ended up being the junior groomsman at my wedding. But my wife and I got married and 
it just it, it I like to start with that story from a professional point of view because it just for me understanding what this kid needed being able to provide it give him a better life developed really good relationships and connection with him and then um, that was kind of my entry point into working with kids and like from there I started working in therapeutic day schools and worked in hospital settings, residential setting, any, anywhere where kids that are struggling behaviorally, emotionally, psychologically, wherever they go to get treatment, I've been in, in those settings. And I just, I, 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 I get what kids need. I understand them. I relate to them well. I have a lot of really good tools in my belt. And you know, I'm just as passionate about working and helping with kids now as I was, you know, 28 years ago when I first got started. Wow. So, 28 years it's been since that first child with autism that you yeah. worked with. Yep. And, you know, I, um, I was in my senior year at my undergrad and I needed to get an internship, uh, is like the final requirement to get my degree. And this girl I was dating said, well, Hey, you should work with this kid that I'm working with in his home. And the only reason I did it is because I was trying to impress her. Right. I had really no idea what I was getting myself into, but, so glad I did because it really just paved the pathway for what I was going to do from that point on. Yeah. And so what do you find is there, is there one, you know, I, I know you're working with children with autism, ADHD, ODD. What, what is ODD? I probably should know this. Yeah. It stands for oppositional defiant disorder. Okay. These are the kids that um, will tell you no and do the opposite. Feel like there's a power struggle all the time kind of this obsessive need for control and power. And the way they get it is by saying no to the most powerful, influential people in their life. And that's the parents and teachers. Right. Right. Okay. And then anxiety, depression. Is there any one or maybe one I didn't mention that you see more common than others? Or is it just a spectrum, a pretty balanced spectrum across all those? Yeah, it's pretty balanced. I would say I probably work a little bit less with autism now than I did that for the first probably 10 years, almost exclusively. Um, but now it's, you know, I, I, I've transitioned from doing direct care with kids to more of a therapeutic coaching model for the parents. And I, I part of what, and we can get into this in a little bit if you want, but part of what drove me to switch from doing treatment for children to coaching for parents is I was really just sick of the mental health field. I feel like it's very focused on symptoms and pathology and labels. And, you know, when you're, you're a child and you're struggling or you're a parent, and you don't know how to help your kid. And you have all these, you know, professionals asking you, what are the problems? What are the symptoms? And you're just talking about that over and over again. It becomes part of the kid's identity. Right. And, you know, one, one of the other things that's really frustrating, not only is, there's all these mental health diagnoses that are put on kids that become their label. But how, how frequently, you know, the profession reaches for medication to try to control or moderate the child. And something wasn't just sitting well with me. Yeah. Uh, it didn't, didn't resonate kind of with where my heart, my spirit is. And it just felt like if I was going to continue in this field, I had to find a different way of looking at things and a different set of tools to equip parents so that they became the hero of the story rather than depending on a, a system that's going to put their kid in a box. I love that so much, Dan. You know, I was just having a conversation, I believe yesterday, it might have been the day before, but I believe it was yesterday with a parent and we were talking, uh, it, it, not a parent of someone, not a parent of a child that would fall in any of these categories that we're talking about that I know of, but kind of a different context. But we were talking about just that topic that you just touched on really, and that is identity and we are what we believe we are. And I know this may be a little bit of a tangent or a rabbit trail off topic, but I don't know how much, I guess I'm going there because I'm curious how much of this plays in that in your 20 some odd years experience in the field, uh, this plays, but I've always had this, well, not always for years now, I've had this belief as I was sharing with this parent, I said, you know, the children are going to believe what the most influential person in their life, especially tells them. And, you know, I've always used the example of the shy girl or boy that when introduced by the parents, you know, meeting a new family, family meeting a new family or whatever, and she's hiding behind or he is hiding behind mom or dad's leg. And it's like, oh, yeah, this is, and the parents are, oh, this is Tommy or Sally or whatever their name is. She, she or he's the shy one. Yeah. 
yeah. and they're sitting there hearing that and they're growing up. What are they going to believe? I mean, they hear it time and time and time again. Yeah, they, they are shy, obviously. But as they grow up hearing this, aren't I mean, <laughs> I'm saying you, you want them to be that way forever because that's what you're programming them instead of telling them the opposite. No, Sally, come on, meet so-and-so. You're the friendly one. You're the outgoing one, you know, and how much, I guess, so that's a, something I was just talking about yesterday and I've shared with a lot of people just the importance that I've learned. I, I look back on my parenting. I'm like, man, six kids later and most of them all grown now. I'm like, how many times have I failed in all these different ways? You know, and I'm like, I hope the next parent can avoid some of the same mistakes. I know that's your heart too. That's why I was so excited to have you on the show. But how much does that play into these children you're dealing with in your opinion? Yeah. So it, I, you know, we could talk about this and do a real deep dive into it because now that is actually the central part of the coaching I do with parents is getting super clear with the identity that you want for them, the character, the values, the morals of the family, and how do you really strategically download that, become the belief of the kid. Because if you can really hit the heart and the belief of a child in, in, in a way that's going to serve them well, they're going to behave in a way that's congruent with that. So like for your example, if, you know, the kid hears over and over and over again that they're shy, they're shy, they're shy, they start to believe they're shy, then they're going to behave in a way that's congruent with that. Yeah. And, you know, I, I part of the frustration I had in the mental health, I actually I didn't say this earlier, but I, I was at a point where I was really burned out and ready to quit. I actually had a job lined up as a financial planner. This is about 15 years into the, the field. And mm. I was just thinking, I, I either have to find a different way to work with kids and families, or I have to get as far away from this field as possible. And working with adults with money as opposed to kids with problems was about as uh, far away from that as I could. But thankfully, when I was at that stage, uh, the boss I had at the time asked me to go to this training. It was called Transform the Difficult Child, the Nurtured Heart Approach. And um, after listening to this guy kind of explain you know, the framework and the mindset behind this approach, it, it just became really clear to me that this is what I've been looking looking for. It's a roadmap, but it's a set of tools on how to change the way kids behave by starting with their heart, starting with their belief system, their mindset, and how do we as the adults really cultivate, uh, we call it greatness, but just a belief system that I'm valuable, I'm competent, I have what it takes regardless of the challenges I have. And it's my job to do the very best for myself because I'm lovable and then inspire others to do the same. Um, that's, you know, that, that's the heartbeat of everything I do right now. I'm coaching and equipping parents and teachers on how to implement this model in a way that's going to go from ADHD, ODD, you know, LMNLP, whatever acronym right. you want for a diagnosis <laughs> to your you're respectful, you're kind, you're competent, you're brave, you're courageous. Here's all the proof. When kids start to believe that about themselves, then, you know, the problems no longer become necessary. They just become little blips on the screen. But the truth is, I have something really important to offer this world, and I'm going for it. I love it. I love it. Well, um, I was going to ask you about the Nurture Heart approach and what that all is. And I think you just answered it. Is that right? In a, in a nutshell, in a nutshell. Yeah, that's a 30,000 foot view of it. Yeah. Getting to their heart and, and their belief system as opposed to almost like, is this a way to say it? Like we're, we're not dealing with the band aid on the issue, like maybe even some medication or even other things. I'm not saying there's not a place for medication, but the other things might try to do, you're getting down to the root level of the cause of the issue. You know, you're not dealing with symptoms so much as you're dealing with the cause and the cause. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm trying to understand and, and articulate what I think I'm hearing. And the cause is the, is the heart and the belief system of the child. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that's, you know, that, that's a good entry point to it, but really what we're after is kid, kids aren't born with an idea, idea about who they are. They don't know who they are, how to function in the world. They're, they're given that based on the experiences they have in their family. Right. You know, and then as they get older, you know, teachers and friends and all that have an impact on it. But what, what if, what if a kid 
who has greatness in them, who has um, you know something really valuable to offer this world, never finds out what that greatness is because the adults are ill-equipped on how to bring it out, and they're super distracted with all the things that drive them crazy, like disrespect or impulsivity or anxiety or depression. And then they rely on a system of professionals that actually reinforce that and get them thinking and focusing more and more and more. And then you put the kid in front of that professional. And and the only reason they're there is because they're having problems. And what kid wants to talk about the problems? Like, good luck manufacturing change when, when that's the system that's supposed to bring them out. And that's the system I've been a part of, you know, for 28 years. Um, you know, what, what, what I've realized is that it's very hard to discern the difference between misbehavior that is in a kid's control versus something that they don't have control. Of. And through this model that I use now, it, it helps people get really, really clear on, okay, this misbehavior is something that they can control, but they're choosing to use it because it provides connection, attention, and identity. And once the parents and teachers learn the set of skills to help flip that, those behaviors go away. If you still have behavior that continues, it's usually a sign that it's something out of their control and they need help and tools and support. But you know, if you don't, if, if you don't have clarity on how to discern the difference between the two, you're going to be super inconsistent. You're going to be very reactive. You're going to be trying something today, then you know, abandoning that. Trying that's a nightmare as a parent. Yeah, it's exhausting. Yeah. Well. And when I go back over the years of 29 years now of parenting six children, I can think back to different times of feeling that way, at, you know, trying yeah. this, trying that. And, I, you know, like I was re- reminding my children all the time, hey, I'm just a first time parent. You know, I'm just a first time parent. We all are. We're doing the best we can. I'm trying to figure this out. Trying to fly. figure it out. I'm thankful for God's word. I'm thankful for mentors, which I didn't have a whole bunch of in my life. I'm thankful for people like you, you know, that are willing to come along and, and help because it's, it's worth investing into. That's one thing I do believe it is worth marriage is worth investing into children are worth investing into. We've got them. Let's do the best we can. That is the, that is the future. So I, I love that. Now I know that you, you had shared with me that your coaching program provides uh, a framework or a system, if you will, of um, a way to help transform children's difficult behavior using, I think you said three different, I don't know, pillars or strategies or points. How, can you elaborate a little bit on that for us? Sure. Yeah. So just like kind of envision a tripod here. If you pull one of those legs away, the whole thing will collapse. So you have to have all three of these working in unison. And a lot of times when I talk with parents, They'll say that, okay, yes, I have those, or I've used all three of those, but never in unison. So they don't get the results. So it's really important just to kind of get started that you have to have all three, otherwise it won't stand. And the whole premise behind this is that your energy as the adult is the most powerful reinforcement for kids. And when I say energy, I'm talking about connection. Anything you do that communicates your paying attention, you're in tune, kids on your radar. Kids are created for that. Actually, we as humans are created for that. We can't exist in isolation. Our, and, you know, and kids' brains actually develop and grow in, in relation to how their needs are being met. And hmm. So the, the three stands are all looking at how we exchange this energy, how we provide energy to kids. And the first one is that you, you have to be super intentional about giving really good energy to what moments where things are going well or when problems aren't, hap- or aren't happening. But you have to do it in a way that builds the kid's identity and belief system up. It's not just, you know, general praise and, you know, I, I call it cheerleader praise. You know, good job, way to go, you're the best, I love you, that was awesome. Like, timing's good, intention's good, but you're not teaching anything, void of nutrition. Um, things like, you know, let, let me ask you this. Thinking back to when you when you were parenting, do you mind if I kind of put you on the spot here? I don't at all, and I don't know. <laughs> I was going to ask, and I don't know if this will do it, but I was going to ask for an example of that of what you're talking about. On the, maybe you're going to give it to me instead of just an "add a boy, good job." Like, yeah, take give me an example or use me. So, what 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 prompted you to have conversations with your kids about respect? 
And what in it triggered or initiated those conversations? Remember? About respect? Yeah, if you were going to talk um, to your kids about respect, what kind of prompted that? I think different, you know, different things. I can't, it, it wasn't always the same. It might have been because I was feeling a lack of disrespect. I'm sure there was conversations. I'm sure there was time when I saw my wife, their mother, getting a lack of disrespect. I'm sure that triggered it to, you know, initiated it. Maybe trigger sounds negative, but initiated it. But I also believe that it was because I understand the importance of having respect for other human beings all human beings, let alone anyone that's in a position of authority over us. And I wanted that for their life because I wanted them to enjoy a better life. So, so your heart's in the right place. I want my kids to be respectful. I want them to treat others with respect. The, the importance of respect and being a respectful human being, you, like you can't under, undersell it. Like it's critical. It's essential. You're going to have a successful relationship and you're not being respectful. Like that just can't happen. However, the, in, in your answer is almost like every time I've asked this question over the last 10, 15 years, 100% of the time, everybody says the time that I usually talked about respect was after or during Disrespect. disrespectful <laughs> behavior, yeah. right? And generally at that moment, kids aren't super open to learning 100%. because they're being confronted with something that they did wrong or a mistake. And so the importance of learning about respect and the value that it brings to relationships is really important, but the timing is after they broke it. And, and so what happens in, in a kid's brain is they're not super open to learning in that moment. They usually like, and, and this is what my kids do. And most of the kids that I've worked with, it's, it's somebody else's fault. There's all these excuses and reasons why they were disrespectful. The other person started it, you know, it's just an, an excuse and, and there's not really maximum learning. So, the first stand of this approach is the time to talk about respect is when you have evidence and proof of your kids demonstrating it because that's the optimal time, right? You know, so, Hey, you, you, um, you put all your dishes away without being told that was really respectful and thoughtful. You know, that's dependable. That's reliable. You got all your home. Like last time I, I woke up around 1230 to go to the bathroom and my daughter who's 14 is at the kitchen table doing homework. <laughs> And, and like initially what my thought is get in bed, right? Right. Like be responsible. But then I was thinking, why in the world is she up? And she's like, I have this really big test. I couldn't sleep. I wanted to get some extra studying. So I'm like, Ella, you're showing a lot of responsibility and respect. You're taking your studies seriously. You're willing to sacrifice sleep to put this as a priority. And you could just see her like kind of leaning into that. And, and because it's, it's tied to proof, Here's exactly what you're doing, and here's the quality or character it shows. It made it really clear to her that that's who she is. She's responsible. She's I love that um, reliable. And, and what happened? And there's like several other ways to go about giving good energy when moments are going well. But the, if a kid hears over and over and over again that they're respectful, that they're polite, that they're resilient, that they're brave and courageous, and you provide example after example, that becomes their belief and identity. And once that becomes secured, then they behave in a way that's congruent with that. Yeah. And I, what I love about that, Dan, is, is beautiful, man. I just love it. Is you're giving them, and you said this, you just said this, but you're giving them evidence. It's not just you're respectful, you're, you've got grit, you've got, you're willing to make sacrifice now, short term for future gain. It's like you're saying these things with actual proof that they're doing it. So they're going to believe it much, much more likely to believe it or believe it quicker and sooner. I love that. So good. So that's number one of three. Is that right? Yeah. And, and yep. So that, that's number one. Absolutely. Yes. To giving really good energy to the moments where things are going well and, and with the intention of providing proof and evidence that becomes their identity and their belief. That's the second stand. And this is kind of to be done in unison is absolutely no of no unnecessary energy for problems. And, and I want to be really clear. This is no unnecessary energy. This isn't like ignoring problem. Whoever said ignore negative behavior and came up with the, kind of that catchphrase, I don't think they really spent any time with children <laughs> right. because kids know where your heart rate's at. They know where your blood pressure's at. They can read all your facial cues. You can be ignoring them and like be ready to erupt inside and they can tell. 
right? You ever been in a room where nobody's talking to each other, everybody's silent, but you can feel tension? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so I, no unnecessary energy for problems because you don't want to inadvertently communicate that I see you as disrespectful, as impulsive, as anxious, as rude. So when we say unnecessary, what that looks like is no lectures, no warnings, no countdowns. Um, my, I, when, when I get stressed, kind of my go-to, my default is threats and bribes. You don't stop doing this. This is going to happen. If you want this, you got to do that first. Right. Just that, that's all unnecessary. That's all drama. It's either you're in bounds or you're out of bounds. If you're in bounds, I'm going to build you up. If you're out of bounds, which goes to number three, I'm just going to let discipline work rather than my energy, my time, my investment into what's going wrong. And, and what's really cool about that is when you flip that paradigm and, and you really are intentional and in charge of where your energy goes, you're not inadvertently shooting yourself in the foot anymore. And when I first heard about this approach, that was like the biggest aha moment for me is, you know, the school I worked at, I'd have these, you know, boys come past my room at in, in the morning and be like, hey, Mr. Dan, can I... Can, can we talk? Can we hang out? And if they were in a good mood and they were doing well, I'd be like, well, I'm kind of busy right now. I'll come get you in a little bit. But if they're in the classroom, you know, disrespecting the teacher or threatening somebody, I'd get paged, come down to the classroom and give them my very, very best. <laughs> I'd give them my greatest tips. I'd be super compassionate. I'd be patient. I'd show a lot of empathy. I was actually, what I was teaching them is when you're at your worst, I care about you the most. And I was given a ton of time and connection to all these problems and inadvertently just saying, hey, this is who you are. This is when you get your needs met. So you have to be really good about being aware of that and, and just not give any of that unnecessary energy. Yeah, that's good. And that leads to the, the, the third stand, which is you have to have just super clear expectations. And if the line is crossed, you're held accountable. And the way that I look at discipline, especially through this lens, is that discipline is the, the opportunity to teach and train skills in the area that you're not equipped yet. So it's not you're a bad person and you need to pay. So here's all these punishments and consequences. It's you're struggling, you're making mistakes. That's actually a natural part of life, making mistakes. It's actually the necessary path towards growth, growth and mastery. <laughs> so if you make a mistake, it's not a big deal. I'm not getting worked up about it, but I will hold you accountable. And in the mindset behind this is very similar to how a referee would officiate a basketball game. If a player's dribbling the ball and steps out of bounds, whether it's this much or they're 20 feet out of bounds, the ref just blows a whistle and says turnover. Doesn't chase the player down the court saying, look out, if you step out of bounds, you're going to be kicked out of the game or... Um, you know, that's the fourth time you did it, you, you know, sit on the bench. Like there's no shame. There's no, like the, the ref could care less because it's not their responsibility. And when you get out of the way and just let kids learn from their mistakes, um, what happens is there's no drama and energy around that. And you give them the opportunity to focus on what did I do wrong? How do I fix it, recover and move forward? As opposed to how do I deflect ownership, avoid the consequence and stay stuck? So good. So good, Dan. What would you say is a practical key? I mean, there's all th th this is gold right here, what you just delivered. But is there one thing that you might say is a practical key to just in general successful parenting? Yeah, I need to think about that because I'll speak for myself. For, for me, when I feel like I have confidence and I'm being successful. There, there's a couple of things I have. Number one, I, ha I have to believe that the tools I'm using in my approach is going to get the results that I'm looking for. Mm. I have to know what I'm doing and why. And, and a lot of people, when they become parents, they're, they're just trying to figure it out as they go, as opposed to getting training equipped <laughs> and learn and, and become a master at that. Yeah. The, the other part is I have to have like humility and grace for myself because I'm going to screw up and I can't beat myself up in that because it avoids me from taking ownership and modeling that for my kids. 
So, you know, I, I, I think this approach gives me a good framework on how to parent my own children. But you also need to have like a lot of humility to say, I screwed up, my bad, here's how I'm going to make it right. And then let it go both for the kid and for me. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Speaking of your own children, uh, do you have any challenges with your own children or because you've got 20 some years in, in the profession, you've got perfect children and life is easy for you? Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, be, because experience guarantees perfection, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I have three kids, uh, actually 12, 14, and 17 now. And my 12-year-old, he's my energy seeker, my kid that's a little bit more intense, but he, he has a pretty significant anxiety. Um, I, I don't know if I would call it an anxiety disorder anymore. It used to be, he used to have panic attacks. But um, from, from the time he was three, three and had to start going to like preschool, um, he's always had this huge, huge like emotional meltdown around separation and doing things new. And, you know, it, it, it would manifest itself when it was time to go to school, time to go to the dentist, time to go to basketball practice, time to get a haircut, time to go see the doctor. I mean, anything where he didn't know or he had to do it independently without me or his mom. He he just would would just become absolutely miserable, super anxious, couldn't sleep, dry heaving, wouldn't eat. And you know, he's he's 12, he's in 6th grade now. He still has anxiety, but it doesn't rule his life. It it it's it's a small fragment of it or a small fraction of it. I, on the flip side of that, he knows he is brave. He knows he's courageous. He knows he's competent. And in the moments where he's anxious and unsure of himself, he has a belief in himself because he's had tons of experience of succeeding that he can overcome it, that he can get through it. So he's able to do things that are really uncomfortable. Whereas like in the beginning stages, all he want to do is avoid it and hide. Mm. And I, I don't know, you know, if, you have any experience with this, having kids with anxiety, but man, if you don't have the right set of tools on how to navigate those waters, it is an absolute nightmare. Yeah. Trying to rationalize with an anxious child, it, you know, it's, it, it, it's like trying to convince them, you know, they're in a room, it's on fire. You can see the flames, but just relax. You're not in danger. That's actually what's happening in their brain. They're perceiving something as dangerous that needs to be avoided. And you're trying to convince them otherwise, and, and it's not working. It, it, it's just a dynamic that I just see so many parents suffer from or suffer with because I don't know what to do. And so for your own son, just to keep it at, at home here for a minute, you're not doing anything different with him than you would teach other parents to do? I mean, I, I know we've just scratched the surface of of what you are capable of helping parents with, I'm sure, but a lot of value also that you've just shared in the last few minutes, which has been cool. But is that essentially what you're doing with your son or are you doing anything different? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm using like the nurtured heart model in those three stands and I'm operating within the realm of those stands at all times with them, or at least that's my intention. Right. But like specifically when, when you have a kid with anxiety, I want to be crystal clear before I'm interacting with him that there is nothing he can do that's going to sway me in my confidence that he's capable and competent. So when he's having panic and I don't want to go to school, can I please stay home? If, if I entertain that, I'm actually agreeing with him that he should be afraid of school. He's not capable. He doesn't have what it takes and it should be avoided. So just being really clear in my head that there's no chance I'm feeding any of that because I don't want that to be the message. And in the flip side, it's like, you're absolutely going to school. We'll figure out a way to make that happen um, because you can handle it. Mm. And, and I know that once you get there, you're gonna be okay, you're gonna relax, and then you're gonna be able to have more confidence and more success just stack and stack and stack. I love that. I love that so much, Dan. Where does empathy come in to this situation? Because obviously it's it's an important piece of, human connection and communication, but it, I mean, I, I don't know if this, I'm even going to use the right terminology, but I'd say if taken too far and maybe you can't take empathy too far. So that's where I may be just 
not know what I'm talking about, but I feel like someone could, in the name of empathy, let me say it this way, in the name of empathy, enable maybe and not walk out what you just talked about. So, so that's where my mind went when you said that, like, where does empathy, how does it fit into that? Yeah. So this is a great question because that is super fuzzy for a lot of people. Like where does empathy start and end Yeah. (laughs) so that you don't start enabling? So you can, I'll just speak for my son. I can have a lot of compassion and empathy for how difficult it is for him. His brain works differently. He's clearly emotionally distraught. I can have a lot of compassion and empathy for his emotional experience without agreeing that he's in danger or without agreeing that this should be avoided. How? How do you do that? So, yeah. So, so Ben, um, I, I, I see that you're really, really stressed. I see that you're really worried. You don't want to leave the house or you don't want to go to, you know, the, the, the dentist. You're actually really scared. I can see it. You're crying. You're begging. You're asking. Period. I can notice his experience. I can create space for it. I can say it makes sense to me, but we're still going. Right. I Like, I don't say, it, but we're still going, but I can create space and say, like, yeah, it makes sense to me. Like, you're really worried that this could happen. You're obviously stressed. You're having a hard time sleeping. You want more than anything just to stay home. Period. You know, and that, and I think that's where that's where if you don't have a period or a pause after those kind of reflective statements, then you get into, well, what should we do instead? Or maybe we should stay home or what are the problems and the solutions? That's where you start to get into enabling or starting to take. Um, I call it just taking responsibility for the kids res- um, for, for things that the kids need to have. on. It's his job. It, 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 it's our kid's job, but it's in, in, in my case, it's my son's job to learn how to manage his anxiety and get his responsibilities done regardless of how he's feeling. I can't do that for him. And if I try, then I'm actually robbing him of the opportunity to overcome something that he needs to overcome. So good. That's where enabling comes in is when you start solving the problem or start to become the hero of that story rather than leading your child to become the hero of their own story. Right. So good, Dan. Ah, this is great. Great stuff. I mean, there's probably a lot of things, you know, we'd all want to say and and, uh, to answer this question, but what is one thing that you would like to give some advice you might love to give your younger self? We can keep it in the realm of parenting. We can take it outside the realm of parenting. I'm good either way, but just one piece of advice you'd love to have known years ago and that you would give your younger self if you could (laughs) ask for help immediately and surround yourself with experts Mm. that are where you want to be or that know how to get through what you're going through i i i think for me being the oldest of six and having a lot of responsibility and i think inadvertently the message i got is that like what you need like the needs I had weren't really important. It was how do you meet the needs of others? And, and, I'm, and my parents didn't do that intentionally. It's just like when you have a lot of kids running around, the, the kids that are infants definitely take precedence over the ones that are adolescents. Right. Um, but I inadvertently kind of got this message that you don't ask for help. You figure out a way to do it on your own. You become super independent, which to an extent is really important. But it, it didn't become like I didn't get to this point of I really need some help and it's okay to ask for help. And how do I even go about doing that? Probably until I started, like, until I became a parent. That's when I started to realize, like, shoot, this is super isolating. I need help. I need some ideas. I need to know I'm not like just screwing all this up. Where's my band of brothers at? And slowly but surely, I started to put those people in my life. I, I wish somebody would have told me that when I was a teenager. Yeah, I, I agree. I, my, my son, who's the oldest, he's 17. He's graduating high school this year. There's, there's been very specific times in his life where I can tell something's going on, and he's like, I don't want to talk about it. Because there's almost like I need to get through it on my own. I don't know if that's just you know innate in boys trying to become men, because they think that I have to figure this out on my own. And I've been able to intervene in those moments and say, that's a lie. 
That is a lie that I don't want you to spend a mo- an- another second entertaining. God put me in your life as your father to teach you the lessons <laughs> because I already have 50 years of experience. And mistakes. Like and- if you were meant to do this on your own, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like God would have just sent you off to live in the woods somewhere. Yeah. You know, you're in this home. It's my job to shepherd that and teach you that. And what is going on? I've been through some of this stuff. I can help guide you. Or if it's not me, who else can we put in your life? You know, and 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 I think if I would have had that, um, I probably wouldn't have had to go through so much stuff independent on my own, thinking that, you know, there's something wrong, as opposed to we're meant to live in community. We're meant to have people ahead of us and behind us. That's so good. So good. You know, we have six children. One. I, I jokingly say all boys except for five of them, um, but our one son is 19. So in that era of 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, right, in that era of your son's age of, you know, us having those conversations, and I respect that, hey, I need to learn on my own. I respect the heart behind it, but the wisdom that you're sharing, and I'm trying to continue to teach my son too, is man, nobody shared this with me at 19 or in your son's case, 17. Like I wish somebody, now I don't know if I would have listened. That's a whole nother conversation, but that's not our job is to force someone to listen. Our job is to share truth and try to guide like you're doing such a great job of. I, I love that you mentioned that. Dan, uh, just some kind of 30 second kind of quick questions kind of in rapid fire here for you as we begin to kind of wind this down. Um, do you have a favorite success quote you'd be willing to share with our audience? Or any quote for that matter? Yeah, I, I, actually, if I could share two, yeah. one's a Bible verse and one, one's kind of a quote from Jordan Peterson. Um, and, and this kind of goes along this idea of fear and anxiety. The, the Bible verse, and this was actually part of our, you know, during our wedding, this was one of the scriptures that we read, but it's um, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for what he's done. And then you'll experience his peace which is far more wonderful than what the human mind can comprehend. The, the reason that that's really helpful for me is because, n- number one, it says don't, don't worry or don't be afraid of anything. But here's what to do instead, pray. Well, okay, how do you pray? Well, tell God exactly what you need, <laughs> but then start focusing on what you're grateful and thankful for. Thank him for what he's done. And what's really interesting is, when you're grateful and you're focusing your thoughts on things that you're grateful and thankful for, it naturally dissipates the anxiety, worry, and fear. Right, and that amazing. Like you can't have those two emotional states at the same time. You know, so so from just like a treatment perspective and helping my kids navigate the the waters of fear, worry, anxiety, myself. Like to me, that's a great recipe or formula. And the, and then what Jordan Peterson says about anxiety treatment. He's like, it's not about becoming less fearful. It's about becoming more brave. And I think a lot of times what we do as parents or even, you know, mental health professionals, we're so focused on how do we get the anxiety to go down, go down, go down. But that's going to happen as you increase your courage and bravery and you face your fears. Mm, So good. Yeah. I just find like, just personally, Like when I approach my worries and fears that way, because there's things I get anxious and worried about. Um, And and when I'm able to help train and equip parents to bring that out of their kids and actually demonstrate that for themselves, like progress is is inevitable in my experience. Yeah, Yeah, I love that so much. And I love, you know, being reminded of that. I love that Philippians 4, 6, and 7 passage that you quoted. I love... um, even just that idea that you were referencing Jordan Peterson's quote about it's not if, if, well, if get this, if there was no fear, I know you know this cause you just said it, but if there was no fear involved then courage or you used a different word than courage, bravery, right? Synonym, synonym, pride. But if there was no fear, this helps me a lot. Like if there was no fear of anything, then courage or bravery would never be required <laughs> ever. Yeah. Like the only way yeah. to be courageous or, or brave is in the face of fear. And and that's always encouraged me because I think so many times, I know for years, I, I just, I think a lot of people, they just want, like you said, they just want the fear to be gone. And that's not reality for anybody. We all are going to face fears. It's what we're going to do in the face of it. Are we going to hit the courage button or are we going to let the fear control us? Oh, so good. Such great stuff. 
Is there uh, one habit that you could, when you think back on or just think about your life, Dan, that you're like, hey, this this is a habit, again, keep it in parenting or or not, um, that has helped you be successful? I can give you like the correct answer or I can give you like a genuine, authentic one. Oh, well, I always like general and authentic. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, get up on time, be self-disciplined right. at the gym, right. you know, make sure you drink your right. water, get your mat, like all the physical stuff. But I'll, I'll stick with parenting. I, I, I think the habit that has drawn me the closest to my kids is being really transparent with them where I'm at. Mm. And, and, you know, I, I used to think that, like, we shouldn't share that kind of stuff with our kids. That's like adult stuff. But w- when I, my, my kids know when I'm not in a good space. They know when I'm struggling. Like I, all of my kids at times have said, dad, what's the matter? You know, and I'm usually nothing. I'm fine. Or I don't want to talk about it or it's parent stuff or dad stuff. Like when I actually am just really open and honest with them, I feel like that habit really unites us, but gives them the opportunity to trust themselves. Because when they perceive somebody is sad or upset or angry, and then they check in, the person says, no. Like, I think that just confuses them and, and sends a message. You can't trust yourself. Mm. So, so like, I'm, I'm really close with all of my kids. I, I have really good connection with all of them. And when they're like, what's the matter? And I'm honest with them about what's going on to the degree that's appropriate, obviously. It gives them the opportunity to trust themselves for me to, um, like to gain like support, but then also for them to have the opportunity to love and care for someone. And, and again, it's not this weird, like they're taking care of me stuff, but I, I, I really have found that that habit when my kids ask that, like I'm, I try my very best to answer it genuinely, honestly, and authentically. And yeah, I feel better. They feel better. And um, it also models for them that, you know, when they're not in a good spot and I come and say, Hey, what's going on? It opens up the door for conversation rather than, oh, I just need to suck it up. I shouldn't talk about it. Yeah. It, you know, you, you mentioned an interesting point there I, I wouldn't have thought of, I don't think, is it allows them to trust themselves, what they're perceiving to be reality, right, when you confirm it. But also it probably makes them trust you more or me more as the father. Like, okay, I know what I'm seeing or I know I think I know what I'm seeing and he's or she it's the mother is willing to be honest enough with me to tell me what I'm seeing is true. I would guess it strengthens the relationship in that way too. Now I think there's a danger in that too. Not, not that there's a danger in that, but there like in everything, there's a danger. There's an extreme probably to any topic we want to talk, every good thing we want to talk about, you can drink too much water and kill yourself. So, um, but is there something, you know, what, what do you say to, I guess I've seen this, this is my opinion. I've seen parents maybe in broken homes where they're going through a traumatic divorce, you know, traumatic experience. And one of the parents, in my experience, I can think of a couple of mothers that have really like tell all, you know, to the, like that, that child at 12 years old or 11 or 10 or eight or 13 and going through their own challenges. And then all of a sudden now, yeah, what's wrong, mom, boom, dump the truckload on them. Right. And now they're carrying all this emotional. Yeah weight that they were never intended or designed it to carry. So I guess the that's a comment, but the question is, is there any advice before I move on? I know this is not a 30 second question, but these are important questions. So is there any advice you have, like how you walk that line of, or find that balance of transparency and knowing what's too much to share? Yeah, I'm, I'm super conscientious of that be, because that, that was my childhood. My mom, like, confided in me a lot, and um, especially about, like, her relationship with my dad and um, some things that, like, they were just struggling with. I just became my mom's kind of support yeah, system. Yeah, and, and my wife actually went through the same thing with her mom, where her mom, it, it was almost like our job to take care of our parent rather than our parents' job to take care of us at times. So, yeah, I'm just super conscientious of that. That's why when, you know, I say if my kids are perceiving something's up, if they're asking me, like, I'll I'll share with them as much as I think is appropriate. But I'm not going to go to them and say, I'm struggling. Can I talk to you? Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, so it, it, it's kind of on the kids' terms under the, you know, the, the kids' guidance of what they're asking for, or what they're perceiving, what they're needing. And so it's in their best interest, not I'm lonely, I'm struggling, I need to talk to somebody, I can't contain it. Oh, you're here, let's talk to you. Good point. That's some solid wisdom there. What is one of the best pieces of advice that you've received, Dan, regarding parenting or anything else? <laughs> um, the, so the first thing that comes to mind is when you go on a family vacation, you're going to be miserable. But if your kids are happy, it was a success. <laughs> That's what somebody told my you. Huh? <laughs> yeah, my brother-in-law, we, we always go on vacation together over the 4th of July. My in-laws, they have a cabin up in Wisconsin. We spend a week up there with all our families. And it's, you know, when the kids are younger, it's absolutely miserable. Nobody's sleeping. Um, and, and I just remember, like, really struggling. And he's like, what is your problem? He's like, uh, you know, my kids are inside. They're not outside. They're, you know, sleeping in. They're, you know, watching TV. We're out in the woods. He's like, are they happy? I'm like, yeah, they're having a blast. He's like, well, then, like, suck it up. If you want to have a good vacation, feel rested and enjoy yourself, leave your kids at home. Right. Right. Well, there's a lot of truth in that. Yeah. So setting expectations, I mean, really is what I'm hearing, setting expectations that, hey, you're not going to be giving your children amazing memories maybe and getting your re relaxation in on a family vacation. Boy, can I relate with that? That is true. Yeah, okay. I mean, who's ever taken their little yeah. ones at Disneyland or anywhere else and came back rest, any vacation really, and came back rested? <laughs> oh well and, and 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 to tie into that too it's um because there's a second part of this is be on the lookout for opportunities where your kids ask you to do something with them especially as they get older because it's always going to be inconvenient in a time that you're not expected and your tendency is going to be like i can't so but like yeah just just having this this mentality of saying yes because it's on their terms, it's when they're asking, and if you say yes, and when it's on their terms, um, you, you're going to find that there's a whole lot more opportunities. But even last night, 10.30 at night, my daughter comes out of the room in a panic because she was supposed to make this Mexican meal for, for one of her Spanish classes. And she's like, will you please take me to the, to the store to get groceries? And I was like, my heart was saying, absolutely not. I'm exhausted. I'm going to bed. You should have thought of this before. But because I said yes, and I was prepared for that, she was so grateful. She almost started crying. She was so like just grateful for my willingness to do that. And and she said, I can't wait to get to school and tell them all about how my padre helped me out. <laughs> my padre. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that that's such great advice. I am glad you mentioned that, Dan, because as they get older, you're right. Th those are the times. And we have a choice whether we're going to flex or not. And those are, the, the, in my experience, and I haven't always flexed, but man, those have been the richest times when I'm willing to do that. And um, it's not always when I want to spend time with them that they, you know, <laughs> convenient for them either or that they desire to. So I'm, I'm glad you, you shared that. Hey, what is one book that you might recommend for the Life's Hard Succeed Anyway audience? Um, so, so like if you're a man... And it's like personal development. My favorite book of all time is Wild at Heart by John Eldridge. Um, I've read that book several times. It was probably the first book I ever read when I kind of got into personal development, and it's still the best. Just kind of talks about the heart of a man and how he's created for adventure and um, kind of God's design. So that, that really resonates well. I'm a kind of an outdoors guy, outdoorsy guys too, so there's a lot of lessons in nature that you can learn it and like as a parent i really think any any of the nurtured heart books there, there's one that's called transform the difficult child the nurtured heart approach it was designed and created for parents that have kids that are challenging but it's 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 such a powerful model on how to raise healthy humans and the the cool thing about this nurtured heart approach is it was initially designed for teenagers that were acting out but as, as we started implementing it in all these different settings, there's trainers like myself that lead marriage retreats. There's guys that go into like use it in executive coaching. I've done school consulting on climate and culture of the building using this model. It, it's, 
the model I use to raise my own kids is very biblical based. Um, so if you're looking for a parent on really how to elevate your connection with your kid, that book's phenomenal in my opinion. I love it. A couple last questions for you. What, uh, what is Dan's definition of success? If my kids feel loved and know they're loved by their father. I love that. Yeah. I'm in a season, you know, just my kids. That's my like primary focus. I'm really, really intentional about that. And if they feel loved, if they know they're loved and they're valued, especially by their father, then that's my number one definition of success or metric of success. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, what is the best way for our listeners to connect with you, Dan, follow along on your journey, get any resources you may have uh, available, all that good stuff? Yeah. So um, best thing to do is just go to my website. It's thecompassforlife.com. And it's the number four. So thecompassforlife.com. If you want to reach out to me directly, especially around my 90-day coaching program, um, just fill out the contact form. Let let them uh, let me know that you know you listen to this podcast. I'll actually reach out to you directly. Spend some time on the on the phone, just kind of getting to know like what your needs are. I'd be, I, and I would actually respond to you directly on that. Or um, you can just sign up to be on my my email list. I have a couple of free eBooks that I wrote for parents, and then I give tips and strategies just on how to elevate your relationship with your kids. And if you're in a place where, you know, um, your kid isn't responding to like the tools that you currently have, and there's just a lot of stress, definitely give, give me a call. I can help you get out of that. I think one of the hardest things for parents, you know, w when we decide to become a parent, we have this vision of how our relationship's gonna be with our kids. And when that doesn't happen, and our kids aren't responding and we feel helpless, that's a very dangerous emotional state to be in because you're responsible for your child. And if you don't know what to do, you're going to start to panic and you start to become desperate and you're going to do things, um, whether that's giving in too much or you're yelling or whatever. I can actually give you a real clear roadmap on how to flip that in a really short amount of time. And that's kind of where my mission and my heart's at. I love it. So the compass, the number four life.com. We'll put that in the show notes below. So it's easy to access. And Dan, uh, this has been amazing. I want to give you the last word, any closing comment you might want to share with our Life's Hard Succeed Anyway listeners on the way out. Um, parenting is hard. It's never going to be easy, um, but it's super fulfilling and rewarding if you have the right tools to connect with your kids. So um, whether that's reaching out to me, reading books, getting some support or help, but you can always elevate your relationship with your kids. My kids are 12, 14, and, and 17 now. Um, I only have a few more years left where they're living in my home. So I want to maximize that time and help other parents maximize it as well. Such a worthy endeavor and, and thing to invest our time into. Thank you so much, Dan, for all the wisdom, knowledge, experience, expertise that you've shared with us today. This has been fun. Yeah. Appreciate the opportunity. If you love this podcast, grab some of Alan's free resources on his website at alanblain.com, spelled A-L-L-A-N-B-L-A-I-N.com. You can also find links to Alan's Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok there in his contacts page. Lastly, if you can leave a five-star review for us on your favorite podcast app, that will get these messages out to more people and it will really mean the world to us. Thanks in advance and make it a great day.